Hello and welcome to this short service of worship for Sunday the 7th of June 2020. We are now on the second Sunday of the first phase of coming out of lockdown here in Scotland and it is the 12th Sunday when we've not been able to meet together in our church buildings. It's also Trinity Sunday today, the Sunday when Christians traditionally focus in on the fact that we worship one God in three persons, Father, Son and Holy Spirit. Today we also begin a new preaching series, a six-week summer preaching series on the book of Job, where we'll be, we will be examining the question of suffering. We join together in worship with our call to worship. We gather to worship and praise God, who gives us all that we have. May God's name be praised in unison from wherever we are. Now we're going to sing a couple of hymns this morning and the words will appear for you. The first hymn we're going to sing is Awake My Soul and With the Dawn. Eternal God, we worship you as the one who created the universe, who made the stars and the sky, the colours, the fragrances all around us in spring, the one who is the caring parent of us all. We worship you as the one who lived among us, who showed us the face of God, who died and rose again for us. We worship you as the one who inspired the writing of the scriptures, the one who speaks to us as we read and hear them, the one who unites us even as we gather from our different places. Holy God, we worship you and we praise you for all that we have in our life, for the breath in our bodies, and we confess our sin to you today, especially the hurt that we have caused and our refusal to admit our part in the problems of the world, including racism. Have mercy on us, O God. We receive your forgiveness with overwhelming gratitude and we commit to living lives worthy of your calling 
In Jesus' name, amen. Now, I wonder if any of you have read any fairy tales recently or are fable. Have you watched a Disney film? Because a lot of them are based on fairy tales. Have you noticed that a lot of stories for children, especially, begin with the words, once upon a time, in a land far away? The story of Cinderella begins with, once upon a time, a girl called Cinderella lived with her stepmother and stepsisters. The story of Pinocchio begins long ago in Italy. There lived an old clockmaker named Geppetto. And even the Star Wars films begin with the words scrolling up the screen, a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away. I wonder what is your favourite Once Upon a Time story? These stories which begin in that way, probably mean that they didn't happen or that they happened a very long time ago. It might be that it's a true story or it might be that it's made up. In Scotland, we have lots of stories. We have stories about Robert the Bruce. Some of them are true and some of them are based on truth and have become legends. We have stories about Selkies, stories about the Loch Ness Monster, Sometimes it's hard to know what bits of a story really happened and which parts are pretend. I think the story of Job in the Bible is a kind of legend that the man Job probably did exist. But the story we read is something that has been made up, a parable, like the stories that Jesus told because it helps us to understand something about ourselves and about God. This book of Job, which we will be reading for the next six weeks, helps us to think about the question of suffering, why it happens, where is God in all of it. So we'll be looking at that for a while and hopefully we'll find encouragement in, in, these, in this story. So we're going to hear the reading from the book of Job and it's going to be given today by Hazel. Today's reading comes from the book of Job. Chapter 1, reading from verse 1 to verse 22. Let us listen to the word of God. There was a man named Job, living in the land of Uz, who worshipped God and was faithful to him. He was a good man, careful not to do anything evil. He had seven sons and three daughters, and owned 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 1,000 head of cattle, and 500 donkeys. He also had a large number of servants and was the richest man in the East. Job's sons used to take it in turns to give a feast to which all the others would come and they always invited their three sisters to join them. The morning after each feast, Job would get up early and offer sacrifices for each of his children in order to purify them. He always did this because he thought that one of them might have sinned by insulting God unintentionally. When the day came for the heavenly beings to appear before the Lord, Satan was there among them. The Lord asked him, What have you been doing? Satan answered, I have been walking here and there, homing around the earth. Did you notice my servant Job? The Lord asked. There is no one on earth as faithful and good as he is. He worships me and is careful not to do anything evil. Satan replied, Would Job worship you if he got nothing out of it? You have always protected him and his family and everything he owns. You bless everything he does and you have given him enough cattle to fill the whole country. But now, suppose you take away everything he has. He will curse you to your face. All right, the Lord said to Satan, Everything he has is in your power, but you must not hurt Job himself. So Satan left. One day, when Job's children were having a feast at the home of their eldest brother, a, me a messenger came running to Job. We were ploughing the fields with the oxen, he said, and the donkeys were in a nearby pasture. Suddenly, the Sabians attacked and stole them all, 
They killed every one of your servants except me. I am the only one who escaped to tell you. Before he had finished speaking, another servant came and said, Lightning struck the sheep and the shepherds and killed them all. I am the only one who escaped to tell you. Before he had finished speaking, another servant came and said, Three bands of Chaldean raiders attacked us, took away the camels and killed all your servants, except me. I am the only one who escaped to tell you. Before he had finished speaking, another servant came and said, Your children were having a feast at the home of your eldest son. When a storm swept in from the desert, it blew the house down and killed them all. I am the only one who escaped to tell you. Then Job stood up and tore his clothes in grief. He shaved his head and threw himself face downwards on the ground. He said, I was born with nothing, and I will die with nothing. The Lord gave, and now he has taken away. May his name be praised. In spite of everything that had happened, Job did not sin by blaming God. Thanks be to God. Amen. Thank you, Hazel. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The Bible is made up of all sorts of different kinds of writings. In the Old Testament, you will find books which tell the history of the people of Israel. You will also find books of poetry, of prophecy, of philosophy. There are books of, of law and there are apocalyptical writings. Within the Old Testament, the book of Job is a book of wisdom. It doesn't fall directly within the books of history. And it's written, as we've said, to help readers think about the question of suffering. I've recently come to think of the book of Job as being something like the script of a play. For the first scene from our reading today, you might want to imagine that you are at a play, you're in the audience in a theatre. Settle yourself in your seat. The curtain rises and there you see Job sitting centre stage with his wife going about their, their daily duties and we see Job observe his, observe his religious practice of offering sacrifices. Now just off the stage at the front there is a narrator. You hear her as she explains to you that Job is a very well off man, a very well thought of man. He is the best, actually, of all the men that lived at that time. She tells you how religious Job is, how pious he is. And then she tells you that he has so many animals, so many servants, he's very rich. And that he has ten children, seven boys and three girls who are all grown up, not living at home, and who get on very well with each other. They party together. Then the stage lighting dims and a platform above the stage appears as it is lit up. And on that platform, you see the figure of God sitting there. God has a visitor who is Satan, who has come from his roaming around the world. You see Satan sitting, talking to God. In the book of Job, Satan is called the Satan because it's not really a name, it's a description, also known as the accuser. Jesus met this Satan also with a small s in the wilderness when the Holy Spirit led him out to be tempted. We remember that time during the period of Lent. In the stage play, as we watch it, God points to Job and you see the Satan taking notice of him. You hear them speaking about Job and suddenly there is a flash of lightning, a roll of thunder, the wind begins to rise and the audience knows that Job will be put to the test. God and the Satan fade into darkness and the lighting focuses your attention again on Job and his wife, still going about their daily business 
unaware of what has just happened above them in the heavenly realms. Almost immediately, a servant comes running on stage, out from the wings, breathless and bedraggled, speaking terrible news of animals stolen, servants killed. Another servant arrives in the same condition and another, all of them bringing bad news, speaking of terrible loss. Until the fourth one appears and you already know the news that he is going to bring. Job's children are dead. All of them? Yes. Within this unspeakable loss, you see Job tear his clothes, shave his head, bow down on the ground. And you see him and you hear him worship God with the words, I came into this world naked and I will leave it in the same way. The Lord gives and the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. The narrator at the side of the stage explains that Job continues not to sin by doing this. Each week for the next six weeks, we will look at a different part of this play written about Job and we will ask a question relating to suffering. This week our question is the same question that Satan asked God about Job. It's not really a question about suffering, but one which we need to sort out before we encounter suffering. The question is, why do we worship God at all? Why did Job worship God? He offered sacrifices on behalf of his children whenever they had a party, just in case they had sinned and so therefore they were covered for their sin. Is our faith just some kind of insurance policy? I once heard of a man who said that he was glad to worship God on a Sunday. He was happy to give money to the church. But if anything ever happened to one of his children, then his relationship with God would be through. Is that the kind of religion that we have? Is it, a, is it a deal with God that makes sure that we and our family are okay? That kind of faith will eventually fail because when suffering comes, and it, and it will, we will feel terribly let down by God. We might even decide that God doesn't exist or that we cannot worship a God like that because God has not acted in the way we would have wanted if we turn to the New Testament, the book of wisdom there is the book of James. James even mentions Job as someone whom we honour for his endurance during suffering. In chapter one of the book of James, we read these words. Pure and genuine religion in the sight of God the Father means caring for orphans and widows in their distress and refusing to let the world corrupt you. If that is true, then real religion is not about making ourselves feel good or safe. It's about more than our Sunday worship, more than our giving, than our praying. It's more to do with the way we care for the poor and the marginalised, according to James. We saw the opposite of this genuine religion during the past week when President Trump of the United States held up a Bible in front of a church as a way of asserting his God-given authority. I think we will all agree that that's not what the Bible is for. In contrast to Trump's actions, the Bible speaks of liberty for the captives, freedom for the oppressed. But we also see the opposite of true religion when church leaders cry out in anger against this misuse of the Bible while failing to condemn the murder of George Floyd, refusing to question their own white privilege or to admit the inherent racism within our own communities. True religion is not concerned about self. It doesn't feel the need to defend God. It's more to do with the suffering of others and what we are going to do about it. At some point, we have to turn away from our own self-pity and look to God, just as Job kept his gaze fixed firmly on God throughout all his suffering. As we gaze upon God, 
if we can see past our own religiosity, we will find the love of God. Even in the midst of pain, we can know the love which held Jesus on the cross, love which was for each of us. The challenge is to worship God, not for what we get out of it, but in order to give back that what we have already, that which we have already received. We, we worship God in response to the great love shown to us, the forgiveness offered us, the freedom given to us in Christ Jesus. All praise and glory be to God the Father, God the Son and God the Holy Spirit, one God in three persons. Amen. Let's pray. Some of the words of this prayer are taken from the Spill, Spill the Beans material. God of mercy and love, we hear of Job and all he was blessed with. We hear how, we hear how it was all lost and still he gave you praise. We are mindful that in our world there are many Jobs, people who have suffered greatly lost everything and yet they still turn to you, they still praise you. We pray today for people who have lost their livelihoods, especially in these days through the effects of lockdown. May they have enough right now and in time may they find work again. We pray for those who have lost property, those whose homes, belongings, crops, have been destroyed through war or a natural disaster. May they know your presence with them now. May they have the strength to rebuild. We pray for those who have lost loved ones and friends and those who are ill, especially in these days of coronavirus and isolation. May they be consoled. May they find hope for the future. May they be healed. We pray for those whose daily plight is becoming known to the world, those who struggle under unjust, racist or corrupt systems. May they know your love and strength to carry on. May they stand up for what is right. And God, we pray for ourselves, for the burdens we carry, for the pains we suffer, for the times we feel tested and aggrieved, that we may be able to see beyond our own suffering to the suffering of others, that we might be able to speak out against injustice and that we may be able to praise your name, whatever our circumstances, as we know your comfort and love. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We're going to sing another hymn.
May God's blessings surround you each day as you trust him and walk in his way. May God's presence within guard and keep you from sin. Go in peace, go in joy, go in love. Amen. And now may the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son and Holy Spirit, be with you and with all those whom you love now and forevermore. Amen.